we're just gonna roll with it this morning. I've got three microphones. <laughs> I'm gonna take I'm gonna take one of them off. Uh, such is the live stream life. Yes. Anchored in Christ, persevering together. Well, we could not hope for a better summary of what that looks like than Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. If you want to get your Bible open to Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, we're just going to look at those three verses today as we continue to walk through Lent. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. This, 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 uh, this passage is a short, explosive tour de force of the powerful underpinnings of the church's life in Jesus. Let's back up a moment. We're dipping into Hebrews today just a little bit. So let's back up and let's remember some things about the epistle to the Hebrews. Hebrews was written to a small and insignificant, or seemingly insignificant anyway, gathering of Jewish Christians. That's why it's called Hebrews. It's not the book in the New Testament about how to brew coffee. Ha ha. Funny joke. (laughs) Thank you for that sympathy laugh. That was lovely. Uh, (laughs) the, The Hebrews were marginalized by their culture, and they were kicked out of the local synagogue. They lost their livelihood in becoming Christians, in believing that Jesus was the fulfillment of the hopes of the Old Testament. And some of them began to wonder, is Jesus really worth the trouble? Perhaps I can just go back to my former life in Judaism. And to that question, the preacher to the Hebrews says, don't you dare sink back into the shadows because you have the reality. You have the hope of the ages. You have the substance of the Messiah. So don't go back to the shadows because you have a great high priest over all the family of God. He is worth whatever sacrifice gathering together brings. That's really the message. That's really the encouragement of Hebrews. So we have to keep that in our mind as we look at these few verses. That's what he's really writing about. So our time today, we want to focus on three things. Just three things. First of all, we want to get clear in our mind the ministry of our great high priest. The ministry of our great high priest. Second, we want to look at our confession about him. And third, we want to look at our bold worship because of him. So just those three things. The ministry of our great high priest, our confession about him, and our bold worship because of him. So let's look first at the ministry of our great high priest. Read verses 14 and 15 with me again. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So first... We're told that Jesus, our great high priest, has passed through the heavens. What does that mean? He has passed through the heavens. Well, you have to understand the Old Testament background here. Jesus is being contrasted to the ministry of the Jerusalem temple and the priests there. The priests of the Old Testament temple were temporary, they were sinful, they were earthbound, and they couldn't finally deal, finally and fully deal with the problem of sin. Jesus, on the other hand, offered himself up as the perfect once-for-all sacrifice. He's both the priest and the victim. Priest and sacrifice. On the cross, he's the Lamb of God, but he stands now in heaven itself as our great representative, carrying all of us with him, carrying his sacrificial death there for us before the Father. Never to be done away with. Never to have to be repeated. We often speak of what Jesus accomplished for us in the Christian life. That by his death and resurrection we are saved, right? But how often do we think, Christians, of the present ministry to Jesus for us? Listen, this week, right now, you are not thrown back on your own strength in the Christian life. Jesus Christ prays from you, for you. Amen? 
He empowers your life in Christ now. He is your mediator this moment and for all eternity. Christ Jesus mediates for us. We sing it. We often sing that song, Before the Throne of God Above. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me. Christ prays for you. Christ prays for his bride. For every son and daughter. That is such good news this Lent and this week. Moreover, the one who presents the offering of himself before the throne of the Father and intercedes on your behalf knows your weakness and temptation because he learned obedience through what he suffered here on earth. He earned his status as our great high priest. That's what Hebrews means when it says in chapter 5 that he was made perfect. It's not that Jesus lacked something, but he was made perfect through what he suffered. He was made perfect to be a good and faithful high priest. Because of this, he now imposes all his worthiness into us, and he receives us as we are through repentance from sin and faith alone. Because Jesus is a good high priest, he's able to deal gently with sinners, to sympathize with them, to receive them, and help them because of who he is. He is the sure refuge of weary souls and the bleeding side in whom we may find a permanent shelter. Not a temporary one like the temple, but a permanent one. Amen? That's the ministry of our great high priest. That's what we're saying. That's what Hebrews is saying when we call Jesus our great high priest. So let's get that crisp. Let's get that clear in our minds. That's what we mean when we say Jesus is our great high priest. Now let's look at our confession about him. So we've got the ministry. Now we look at our confession about him. Back to verse 14 again. Since then we have a great high priest. What's the, uh, what's the outcome of that? Let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. Verse 14 roots the exhortation to hold fast to our confession in the greatness of who Jesus is. Remember, the message of, Jesus, uh, message of Hebrews is that Jesus is greater. He's greater than the promises given under the Old Covenant. He's greater than anyone who has ever lived. Greater than any other servant of God. Greater than any other hope. Just greater than. That's the message of Hebrews. Now let's pause there for a moment because there's something that's really critical here. And it might escape our notice. It may have already escaped your notice. You might not even be giving it just a moment's thought. There are two small words here in the English that make all the difference. All the difference on how you should think about this passage, interpret this passage, apply this passage to your life. You know what the two small words are? Actually, it's just one in the Greek. But the two small words are, let us. Let us. Now, I want to raise the question. This is where the sermon kind of turns a little bit. How does that change the way we think about this passage? How does this change the way we think about the Christian life? And here's what I'm getting at. The writer of the Hebrews is addressing a local body of believers. Think with me again. He's exhorting them to remain steadfast in their worship of Christ and their confession of him. Now, let me ask you this question. How much of Scripture do you think is addressed to individuals? The answer is none. Now, you might be able to find some limited apparent exceptions there, but I would make the case, and I would argue, that all of Scripture is addressed to the gathered church. Not to individuals having Bible study at home. It's all dressed, addressed to the church. And yet our default, if we're honest, is usually to begin to apply the Scripture, what? Individually. Rather than corporately. So here's the difference. To put it differently, we're more prone to ask, how does this passage impact me? How is it going to impact me at the dinner table? at the work office, rather than how is it going to impact my, my life in the body of Christ? 
I'm not saying the first thing is a bad question to ask. I'm saying it's not the primary question that Scripture is asking. And it's certainly not the question that's being asked today. How does this impact my, my life in the body of Christ is a much better question. And it's what the author of Hebrews and what the Holy Spirit is getting at today, I believe. So again, the picture we should have in our mind is not so much a Christian at home having Bible study, privately confessing faith in Jesus, giving thanks for the access that he or she has to God, though we certainly do thank God for that. Because if you skip to that, listen, you're going to miss the point. You're going to miss what Hebrews is saying today. And this is a point that the modern church needs to hear. We need to hear this. Rather, the picture is one of the gathered church publicly acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God, even at the expense of their own potential persecution. That's the context of Hebrews. That's what Hebrews is saying to us today. Now, I want to take a closer look at the confession we're called to make. What What do I mean when I say that? What does it actually mean? I'm not talking about the confession of sin that we make together. I'm talking about the profession of faith in Jesus that we make. And of course, our confession of sin is part of that. And what does it actually mean? Literally in the Greek, it means to say the same words as. This is fun. Homo legias. Go ahead, say it with me. Homo legias. Now, Jacob actually recently pointed out to me that this is where we get our word for homily or sermon, because the sermon, ideally, the homily, should say the same thing as scripture. That's what a homily does. That's what a sermon does. And in our confession of Jesus as the Son of God, we are seeing the same thing as who? God himself. We're saying the same thing about Jesus that God the Father says about him, and that's our confession of faith. What does it say? Let us, uh, let us then persevere in our confession of faith as in Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus as the Son of God. God the Father said of his Son, this is my Son, the Beloved. And the faithful all around the world say the same thing. Our confession is as valuable as the person we confess faith in. And there could be no higher value than the faith that we confess. Hebrews couldn't be any clearer about his all-surpassing worth. Our confession in Christ is priceless. It's priceless. That's what Hebrews is talking about. And this is something that happens before the watching world, not just in the comfort of our own homes. This is why the preacher to the Hebrew doesn't say here, he doesn't say, hey, I know it's kind of tough to be a Christian right now. I know there are some bad things going on. So just have Bible study at home. Note, he doesn't say that. He exhorts them, continue to meet publicly and make your confession of Jesus because he's the hope of the ages and the confession that you make there is priceless. That's what Hebrews is saying to us today. I know I'm saying all this in the, in the context of a pandemic, and I know that's a little more complicated. I know that, that it is. But as the church begins to come out of COVID, we need to take this exhortation to heart, friends. Are we as Christians going to buy into what I call consumer Christianity? There's also DIY Christianity. That's related. Which is marked by... Well, not a love of the church. Or one that's marked by a love of the common, visible, and corporate confession about Jesus. This passage challenges us in Lent about our love for the church, our love for the body of Christ. Consumer Christianity will continue to be on the rise in our culture. But here's the problem with consumer Christianity. It will be more and more, more, I believe, marked by a love of religious product, of spectator programs, of felt needs, of personality cult, and individual fulfillment. Is there room for a love of the body of Christ in that kind of Christianity? I'm doubtful about it. It will largely lack 
care for the actual corporate life of the church, and it will eventually resent pastors and leaders who attempt to shepherd the flock of God. Consumer Christianity is not authentic Christianity. But verse 14 gives us a true picture of authentic and common faith. It gives us a picture of Christians gathered to celebrate the confession of the name of Jesus at any cost. So friends, here's the question. How many of us got up this morning thinking, I will be with the church of Jesus because I have to make my confession of his great name with all the saints? How many of us thought that way this morning when we got up? I think we have to confess, right? That's sometimes pretty foreign to the way that we think. We're talking about coming back to the cross this Lent, aren't we? But what we find today in our passage is that this is also a time to come back to the body of Christ, especially right now in 2021. Hebrews is a time to come back to the body of Christ, to love what Jesus loves, friends. He is the elder brother of the church. He embraces brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, and he wants that for each of us, for each of us. And the church in America needs to hear that this Lent. Third is our bold worship because of him. So our confession about him, but lastly, our bold worship because of him. Let's skip to verse 16. So let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because Jesus is our great high priest and because he can sympathize with our weakness, we are to draw near to the throne. And find it a place of grace and mercy. So here's the picture again. It's not so much someone at home giving thanks for this reality. The picture is one of a gathered people thronging into the throne room because it's been flung open in a way that it never was before. Absolutely available. Every Lord's Day and certainly every day. How does Hebrews 4.16 say that we're to approach we're appro to approach with confidence. I love this. This is the last thing I want to share it with you today. I want, to, I, want to, I want to look at what this words, this word confidence actually means. You know what it literally means? It means to have bold speech with someone. To be bold in the way that you approach that person. To speak boldly. Bold speech on the basis of what? Well, I want, I want to share these words from John Kleinig with you. The opposite of bold speech is a sense of shame from lack of personal worth, embarrassed silence before God and the world that comes from a sense of spiritual and social insignificance. Since Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers, and since he makes them holy, they have the highest possible status. Status that does not depend on their intrinsic worth, but on God's high regard for his son and for the son's high regard for them. Their confidence depends on, on him and on God's promises. Let's unpack that a little bit. So first of all, don't get it twisted. Our boldness is all about Jesus, not about any of us. Not about how cool we are. Not about how modern and intelligent we are and attractive we are. But solely about Jesus. And we hear some even then in the church who might say, I have no need of a mediator in my relationship with God. I don't need one because I'm a Christian. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> and people today are no less sinful than they were in Jesus' day. We may be tempted to think, well, yes, of course I'm welcome. I'm a good American. And besides, my deodorant smells good. Not at all. Not at all. And it is not the case that God has become any less holy. People haven't become better, and God hasn't become any less holy. But rather, in Jesus, we have that much greater of a representative and a mediator. Amen? That's the difference. That's the unthinkable reality of the new covenant. That's what Jeremiah proclaimed in Jeremiah 31. When God says again and again, I will, I will, I will, 
I will. I will make a way. I will make a way. And in Hebrews 4, we see that reality. And here's the thing. All around us, we find messaging that tells us that we have to scuba dive down into ourselves to find our worth. Oh, you hear this everywhere. Everywhere. That we have to dig down and find the gold. We have to uncover the diamond in the rough. Friends, let me tell you something this morning. No, you don't. Stop it. Stop it. The message of Hebrews is that if we belong to Christ, our worth is in Him. Amen. And listen, that fact, the fact that it's outside of ourselves and not within ourselves is precisely why, as a, as a son or daughter of God, you can be bold with God. Are you with me? Because in Christ, the living God is now your father and Jesus is your elder brother. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying to the Hebrew Christians. You may know this famous quote from Martin Luther. So when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God. And where he is, there I shall be also. I love that quote. So good. That is the bold speech of an adopted, forgiven, and cleansed child of God. Amen? Now here's the question. Who wouldn't take up God on that? Who wouldn't take God up on that? The answer is, I, I hope, I pray, no one. No one. And, and friends, this is the thing. Our gatherings as a church are all about this reality. This morning we sung the Kyrie. And to some, that might sound like, that is morbid. That is like uh, boring, you know, like, oh my goodness, find a better song, you know. <laughs> but what that song encapsulates is the fact that we're coming before the throne of God together and we can expect to receive grace and mercy because of our mediator. That's what we're singing. That's what we're saying. Here we need to reflect on what we think a church service is, what do we think church is? Is it just a, a human gathering? Is it a social club? You know, is, is it a performance? Is it a show? Do we have to manufacture what we're doing here, like a TV program? No. No, we don't. Another name for Holy Communion is the divine service. You may know this. Divine service means that here God serves us His own self, His own grace and mercy. Here God pours out His love and His help on His sons and daughters. More specifically, our corporate prayer and our individual prayer, by extension, ought to be marked by this pressing in with God, this expecting to find help, especially in the corporate wor worship of the church. So often we treat our prayer as a church as a last resort, don't we? Well, nothing else works, so we'll break out the snake oil of prayer and see what happens. Something like that. No. Prayer is daily breath. Prayer is the soul's blood. Prayer is the church's blood. Because the throne of grace and mercy is open. The promise stands every Lord's Day and day after day that we may honestly and transparently come to the throne. No longer hiding. That's not for children of Jesus. But as adopted sons and daughters asking for timely help in our, in our time of need. And I love that this passage doesn't even find the need to define how is God going to help us, right? This isn't a, a passage about how to twist God into giving you what you want in prayer. Children trust their parents, right? And so we can trust God to give us the timely help we need in the way that he sees fit. That's the promise of this passage. So, I'm ending. What, what, if, what if Hebrews 4:14 4, to 16 set the agenda for your life and faith as a Christian? 
in our life as a church? What would you need to stop believing and stop practicing? And what would you need to start believing and start practicing, especially as it relates to the church, to the body of Christ? Here's the invitation today. Make your confession of Jesus' matchless name. And come boldly to your Father in prayer and praise. That's what we're here for. Amen? Amen? All right, all right. Then let's do that. Let's rise up and let's make our confession today as we respond to all that's been said in the words of the Apostles' Creed.